HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni, I'm the host. It's our 15th year of weekly podcasts, and we're talking with some folks from Colorado. So this is pretty exciting. It's Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024, and it's our third episode of the year. Um, let's go around the room and we'll all introduce ourselves. I'm Jimmy Carboni, I'm the host. Uh, let's get the kids from Goat Patch on. You guys want to introduce yourself? I'm Darren Bays, uh, head brewer and co-owner of Goat Patch. I'm Avery Dolde. I do events and marketing here at Goat Patch. Great. And our friend from Billy Goat Hop Farm. Hi, I'm Audrey, and uh, I co-own Billy Goat Hop Farm in Montrose, Colorado. All right. So not too long ago, our, our good friend Emily at uh, Radcraft Beer said, how do you feel about a conversation between a brewer and a hop farmer? And I said, that sounds amazing. The last couple of years, we've covered a lot of craft malt uh, and, and other things in the industry. But I haven't had a really good hot farmer on in a while. So um, looking forward to for talking to you. I studied up on my sea hops. <laughs> and we'll talk oh, about good. drinking. And there's a lot of exciting going on here. But I love that you started laughing. Uh, one of the goat patch kids clapped their hands at Audrey and you started laughing. <laughs> I was laughing at the good you said something about a good hop farmer. I don't know. <laughs> no, I was just joking. Yeah. Well let, let's you know, it wasn't too long ago that, that no one was growing hops and no no one was, was growing malt, growing grain for malt um in, in our little industry. T- tell us about Billy Goat Farm, how you guys got started and you know and why hops. Um yeah, so uh, Billy Goat Hop Farm, like I said, uh, we're over in the Western Slope in Montrose, and we have 32 acres of hops with nine different varieties. We do all of our own, um, along with the farming and growing of the hops, we do all of our own uh, harvesting and pelletizing and packaging, uh, marketing, sales, all of our own shipping. Um, so we're, we're stay pretty busy and... Uh, my partner, Chris, and I started the farm going on seven years ago. And prior to the farm, we lived a, a pretty fun seasonal lifestyle, a lot of river guiding and um, ski bumming and beer drinking. And uh, Chris had a much larger background than I did with plants. He grew up doing maintenance on golf courses as well as a lot of different uh, residential landscaping and played with plants a lot. Um, and so at some point in our vagabonding, we decided it might be nice to slow down and, and 
not live in a van. And so um, at the time we were both working in breweries up in Idaho and there was a little shortage in hops. So prices were going up and that sort of sparked our interest into learning more about, about hops, uh, started reading some books and doing some research. Uh, and then Chris got a job with Jackson Hop Farm up in Wilder, Idaho. Uh, he was actually there the year they came out with Idaho 7. It was pretty exciting. So gave us the opportunity to learn a lot about it, um, see if it was something that we thought was reasonable to do. Um, and, and yeah, we had already loved the craft beer industry just in general, uh, outside of the delicious beer, but everybody we met were fun, um, fun folks, a good community of, of people in general. Everyone seemed to like to play outside and, and care about similar things that we care about. And so after that internship, uh, with Nate Jackson, it was kind of like, all right, we're going to do it or we're not. And, uh, so we jumped in, got back in the van, uh, did a three month road trip through five different States, went through a lot of different spots, deciding where to start the farm and, uh, pick Montrose. Uh, we really, we'd spent little to no time in Colorado ever before, but we liked the idea of being away from the Pacific Northwest just because 98, 99% of all the hops in the U S are grown there. And we're not going to be a 500 acre farm. We're not going to be part of the Walmarts of the hop world. And we wanted to separate ourselves from that. Um, Colorado has lots of breweries and um, in general, people care about supporting local Colorado proud. Um, and also, I don't know where else you can farm and in 30 minutes be at 11,000 feet. So that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so that's sort of our our backstory. We got we got rolling. We built the trellis ourselves. We put in twenty three hundred poles, fifty seven miles of cable. Uh, Chris and a buddy built the warehouse. We've slowly been getting all the equipment. Most of it's from the seventies that came over from Germany in shipping containers. Um, but we're hands on from from day one, from beginning to end, and um, produce a high quality hop despite that. We're not, um, you know, the big guys. Yeah. When you guys were looking for the, the land, uh, did Chris have any requirements or ideal soil or, you know, t type of, of land to be on? Did that ever come up? Um, sure. We, we looked at a lot of different pieces of property all over uh, the Northwest and Colorado. Um, took some different soil samples in as we got more serious about locations. Thought about, um, you know, how would how would the land work to fit all the processing you need? Um, because it it really is. It's a lot of equipment and space that's needed for that. Also, how is the land going to work for irrigation? Um, and and outside of just doing soil tests of places, what what what's the growing season look like here? Uh, when do the frosts come? When when do they start back up in the fall? Um, what's your hours of, of sunlight? You know, down here in Colorado, we have a lot more intense sun. We have more kind of saturated sun coming in for a longer period of time, but our days are a lot shorter. I mean, in, in the prime season, as solstice, we're close to almost an hour less a light a day than in the Pacific Northwest. So- wow. These are certainly all things that we took into consideration um, when deciding where to start. Yeah. You know, and when you talk about hops, what, what were the first couple of years like? I mean, I know there's a lot of hard work. You're putting up the poles and all that. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's something I don't like to remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, there were months on end that it went out with a 16 pound pry bar and we're digging pumpkin sized rocks out of out of holes three feet down. Uh, there were sometimes we'd send a person, usually ended up being me, down into the hole and you hold onto the rock and then another person would pull you out because you couldn't like actually hold onto the rock and get out of the hole yourself. Uh, so those, those were some exciting times. Um, <laughs> but, and then, you know, 
putting the poles in, doing the wires. We'd obviously never built a trellis before. We looked at how the trellises were up in, in Idaho and other places we traveled, but there's no manual online. There's no, you know, USDA book on how, you know, how to grow hops. And so it was, we, we made up our own design. We played with graph paper and pencils and erasers for a long time. And, and, you know, you're hanging this wire, like I said, 57 miles of cable up in the air. And then you're setting this crazy pulley system up and and you're pulling the tractor on four wheel drive until the tires are spinning. And that's how, you know, it's tight enough. And then, you know, you hope it doesn't snap and whack you in the face. Um, and, and then, you know, our first year we were on, uh, we didn't have the drip irrigation in cause we got a grant, which is very nice from the NRCS. Um, but we were on flood irrigation and that shoot, that's funny. That's just a funny thing to try and grow hops on flood. Um, there's, you know, weeds and trying to get water to all of them. Uh, that's, you're spending most of your day trying to run the water. It's not like, you know, typically when you use flood, you mark the field and you put trenches in for them to run. And it just doesn't quite work the same with hops in there. Um, then we finally did get, get the drip in. And I mean, for years, you know, we'd have one crew, somewhere out digging up rhizomes. And of course it had to be hot and dry. So you're using pickaxes to get into the ground to get the rhizomes in, in February, April, then another crew at the farm planting them. Um, and yeah, your your equipment that doesn't work. I mean, our first year we had big fresh hop orders. I guess it would have been our second harvest when we finally had some big-ish fresh hop orders. And the electric just totally shit the bed and the harvester went down for three hours and our truck was supposed to be leaving at 3 a.m and it didn't leave till 6 a.m and um you know of course then at 6 a.m we have our morning crew show up so we had like a beer at 5 30 in the morning called at the end of the day and started the next one <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah it, it there's some wild times uh it's it's relentless it's a it's a very very relentless industry to be in Wow. And then you, and then you got to sell them. And that's, that's what, you know, we, we were expecting building the trellis, finding the equipment, how hard all that's going to be and growing the plant in a, in a new area that there's, you know, there's not hop agronomists for Colorado, like there are uh, up North. So that's its own battle. But then now, you know, you build it, they will come. That that's not necessarily true. You know, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta get out there. We've, been not we've knocked on over 800 brewery doors as just a straight up door to door salesman living in a van. Most every brewery in Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, part of North Carolina, and some people they just look at you, and tell you to you know, sorry, no one's here. You go ahead, leave. And then other people will sit there and drink five beers with you. So um, it's it's a trip, you know, trying to get. And as soon as you know one brewer, he's already left and is at another company and. Um, so keeping up on, on marketing and sales has been a whole other job in and of itself. So you didn't just put a sign up on the internet. We have hops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let, let me, let me ask, uh, the go patch guys now. So, um, Darren and Avery, um, what, what's your take on, you know, small hop growers in Colorado, um, meeting Billy goat, you know, when you first worked with them? Um, <clears throat> I think it's great. I think you guys are doing great hops. I think that, I know it's been like, it's, it's probably been four or five years since I've seen you, <laughs> you and Chris. Uh, um, yeah, I think at the time, uh, it sounds like you've got a few more varieties than you had before. Uh, that was kind of a roadblock for us. Was that just the varieties that you were growing or not the, we're not the same ones we were using. Um, so you you guys will have to stop back by again sometime. And, uh, yeah, we'd love to hear about what you got going now. I think you were still kind of trying to get established. We were also trying to get established at the time. Uh, but, yeah, we definitely uh, like to support uh, Loco. Uh, we do one fresh hop beer a year uh, with uh, some friends that actually uh, they're on a small farm just on their property, uh, mostly vegetables and stuff, but they've got some hops on the outside. Uh, but we'd definitely be open to to using more local stuff if we. Uh, but it's got to be kind of the right the right hops though too. And there's like hundreds of kinds. Yeah. So. 
Uh, Audrey, what, 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 what hops were you first growing? Um, we first started out with Cascade, um, Chinook, Crystal, and Nugget. And now, in addition to those, um, that was our first two, three years. I can't even remember now. Um, now, we also have um, Columbus, Magnum, uh, Michigan Copper, Comet, and Multi-Head. Um, yeah. And, and that's, you know, it's very understandable. Like brewers have their recipes and, um, you know, we can't grow the sexy varieties. We can't grow proprietary mosaic, citra, um, you know, Simcoe, Amarillo, all that fun stuff that everyone loves and is marketed and branded by those guys. Um, we couldn't even get them to tell us no, you know, let alone, uh, grow them. So it's, it is hard. And, and yeah, brewers use a lot of different hops. Yeah, I, I remember from New York when when the craft beer, the farm part of the movement was just starting back in 2012, 2014. You know, if if a lot of small farmers were trying to grow like a half acre, they were you know recommended to start with that amount, and people were sharing harvesters. And I know it's come such a long way, um, but it, it's 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 quite interesting the struggle you have to go through, right? I mean, if, if everyone was had 500 acre farms and that's how hops came, um, you, you're, you're you're really a pioneer, aren't you? <laughs> it feels like it sometimes. It, re it really does. Um, and, you know, when we moved down to Colorado, um, over half the farm hop farms that were here when we moved here are now gone. And Michigan is another really big growing area for smaller size farms. And every time I talk to our friends up there, there's there's more that going out because because it is hard, you know. There, there's a lot there's a lot you got to get through, um, and and you know you're also a small business selling to a small business. That's the hardest market to be in because these breweries are also trying to run a small business, and they also have to have a lot of you know ends that they have to meet, and they have time constraints and financial constraints. And so when you can go online to one store and order all your hops, you know, the majority of your malt, you can get some aluminum cans, some cleaner, and it all shows up on one truck. Well, that's pretty easy. One invoice, wham, bam, you're done. Well, now you got to order hops from us and you still got to order hops from Country Malt or Crosby or wherever else you're getting them. And it's an extra step that you do have to do. So that, that's, you know, one thing that's harder from ordering from the small guys. But at the same time, we also have some awesome breweries who have changed their recipes to use um, varieties that we grow. We've had other breweries that create new recipes around our hops because they like them, because they want to use more public varieties, because they want to support local small farm ag. That's what's important to them. So it's, you know, it, it is. It does feel like a wild, wild west sometimes. Um, but... Yeah, these are the decisions I made in life. <laughs> no, that's great. It's a great intro. And, and, and now back back to, to Darren. Um, Darren, just, just to tell us as a brewer, you know, some of the hops that you're using and, um, you know, which, which beers they're in. Right on. So we have pretty much, we have one beer that really drives the entire company. <laughs> um, I guess we're lucky to have it. We like, to, uh, we, we kind of like brewing it. We, we'd rather be brewing some different stuff sometimes, <laughs> but um, yeah. And then we use uh, like some of those varieties that uh, Audrey was talking about in that beer, uh, the uh, like the mosaic and El Dorado and Mandarina. Uh, and that's our hazy IPA, which we sell. It's about 70% of our total production. And then all of our other beers combined, we don't, we probably don't use as much hops in a year as we put into one batch of that beer. So it makes it tough to, to like change a recipe or something. And, uh, but yeah, we definitely like to work together again. I know that we did a, we did a beer once, uh, I think it was about five years ago where we did use your hops and we really liked it. Uh, yeah, wasn't that the the collaboration? Did you do? What, did you and uh, Gilded Goat also do a a beer with their hops? Correct. Yeah. And, uh, so what did yeah, What like, did you brew? Remember what you brewed back then, Darren? Uh, I believe it was a. We did a 
saison and we put some jasmine and rose hips in it and then we brewed we used the kind of like a farmhouse saison yeast down here and then we brewed the exact same beer up in fort collins uh, with david go and uh they did it in a solera so it was like a like a sour like a true sour not a kettle sour but like uh yeah. the bacteria and stuff they'd been growing for however many however long they'd been growing it and uh both beers came out real nice, I think. Yeah, they were so good. And Darren, you're in uh, you're in Colorado Springs, right? Correct. Yeah. So a- Avery, I know you guys do a lot of events. We're going to talk about events too, but um, Colorado Springs is pretty hot. It is. It, is it, how's the ski season right now? Uh, we don't have too much skiing here, but from our buddies that well, we have one of our brew house guys. He also does wholesale. He's snowboarding every week, so. I've heard it's been great. I don't know. That's not my sport, so. Yeah. But I know you, you guys have some great events. You want to tell me about some of the events you've been doing at the brewery and, and some of the festivals you've been part of? Yeah. So we have, um, you know, sticking on the theme of goats, we do, we partner with Rocky Mountain Goat Yoga, who's up in Nevada. And once a month, starting in May, we do uh, Goat Flicks and Chill, which is you come and watch a movie and hang out with goats. They run around. Yeah, it's so cool. They'll run around, jump on your table. They'll come and like, I've seen some, like if someone gets up to go get another beer, or use the restroom, they'll like take over their folding chair and stuff. It's really funny. But we'll do that on a Saturday night. And then the next morning, so a Sunday morning, we'll do a goat yoga. And there's usually like three different sessions and you get to watch people just get trampled by goats essentially. And it's really funny and it's fun and people love it. <laughs> How much do they pay for that? <laughs> um i'm not entirely sure we don't handle any of the ticketing so that's all with rocky mountain goat yoga but we're just the the space to facilitate it we have a great beer garden area here so they'll bring a whole corral and set it up and you know for certain hours there's just a bunch of goats at the brewery out back so uh, oh yeah it's the goat yeah. goat theme episode uh yeah wh- what's goat pack <laughs> what what where's where does the name goat patch come from darren <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess I think it's named after my beard. Yeah. Um, we were throwing some different names around and uh, weren't sure where to go with it. Uh, but I guess the video is not going to be on the radio, but I've got a goatee that's longer than my arm. Uh, but it's not a goatee because I don't have a mustache. So it's just a goat <laughs> patch, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, and, it's. I will say it's. It's at first the, the question was ask him where the name goat patch came from. And the minute I saw you, didn't have to ask you, so. <laughs> um, well, and like your logo in the background too, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, we were throwing some names around, and my wife came up with that one, and uh, Goat Patch had a nice ring to it, easy to say. Uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, we started looking at goats, and like as animals, they're they're like super cool animals, uh, kind of like they're community animals. Uh, and they they just do a lot of. A lot of stuff we like. We think they're funny. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so uh, I, I know that Audrey's growing like some of the sea hops. It, Darren, you want to tell me about the sea hops? You, you know what, what what you've brewed with in the past. You know, Cascade or Chinook or you know, just t- I don't know if you, how deep you want to go into talking about hops. Um. There's yeah. There's a lot of them that start with C. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we've uh, you know we've tried them. Uh, I don't know throughout the years. Uh, Use some different ones. Uh, definitely a lot of Cascade and Chinook and Columbus. And uh, yeah, I think they're all like. It seems if you start a hop with the letter C, it's probably going to be pretty good. I know you said you were growing uh, some copper too. Uh, we've had some of those that were grown in Michigan, uh, not too long ago that we tried that uh, we. We thought those were pretty good. Uh, cashmere is another like newer one that we've been using, uh, also uh, from Michigan, I think. So, uh, yeah, yeah. What am I? I don't know, Audrey. What's the what's the ones am I missing? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot. Centennial's yeah. classic. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's those are lots of great ones. Yeah. Crystal, obviously, that's the one we grow that I think is a is a really fun hop. It just plays well with everything. It just adds a, a little 
depth depth crystals fun yeah, I think that's the one we put in the uh, in the uh, collab with uh, Gilded Goat. And you. you know, I think that's that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, hops. I haven't talked about hops in a while, but you know, even when I try to look up, I, I still feel like people are proprietary about the hops they're using. Even though a lot of breweries I know will, will feature a hop on the, the can or the name of the beer, you know, I was trying to look up some of the the, the breweries that I drink and kind of keep coming up with just like a generic term you know hops that are assertive in both flavor and bitterness are the ingredient of choice for the american ipa and then it just lists out all the hops cascade simcoe amarillo columbus other american hops um but it is it kind of a mystery i mean darren i mean like is there a secret recipe of your hop mix that's what i'm trying to get at because or is it just that it always changes because it's like just from this show, I was like, what, you know, usually when I hear about a grain bill, I, they'll tell me the grain bill, but mm -hmm. I haven't, it, it's, it's harder to find the information about hops on some of these beers. Yeah. Hops are, it seems like they're coming out with a hundred new varieties every year or two. Uh, and then like some of them will catch on and be super hot. And like, we don't even try to get those. Uh, I like to use stuff stuff that i've used in the past uh, is obviously the easiest to work with because you kind of know what you're getting uh what it's going to do to the beer uh we'll occasionally throw out uh an experimental uh some kind of ipa hazier west coast and we'll try some different stuff uh it's usually not whatever the hot new thing is it's usually something that uh, we can talk to people and find out what it's done and beers and stuff and kind of get at least a educated guess on what's what it's going to do in our beer what about hops and, and non-ipas like i know you you had a doppelbock that came out yeah we pretty much uh i think i just used warrior in that one which is our kind of standard bittering hop uh which we uh we like because it's just like clean and uh it adds bitterness but it doesn't do too much else uh as far as uh, like like in a Doppelbach, we're not looking for something super citrusy or pineapple or something. We just want we just want the IBUs, which is uh, I don't know. I've heard it said that bittering hops are, are almost like a just a commodity, <laughs> which uh, so we want that bitterness. We want the clean bitterness, uh, and uh, so a high alpha acid hop with uh, with not a lot not a lot of other stuff going on yeah hey audrey just tell us more about the farm I'm, I'm curious if you think that you know you've been doing this for a few years now is there a colorado terroir of, of the hops I feel like what you're growing comes out differently than what's grown in idaho or michigan absolutely yeah i mean it only makes sense right uh if something's grown in different soil at different elevation and in a different environment, it, it will be different. That's, it's sort of pretty classic or, or standard in wine. You know, is it a Napa Valley grown? Is it, um, you know, I, I don't drink that much for wine. That's the only one I can think of at the moment. There's France, is it in France? You know, um, but they, they are a different grape when they're grown in, in a different area. And, and hops are similar. It's not, it's not like it's a totally different thing. It's not like you're going to get, you know, pineapple instead of pine cone, but, but there are, there are subtle differences. And, and it's interesting because it, there's not a, like a huge amount um, of hops grown in, in other areas to, to have a lot of research and a lot of like data on to say, yeah, for sure this variety grown in this area like definitely has this characteristics that are different we're getting it over time um you know michigan started a um chinook cup because because there's been enough grown that they feel like it has different characteristics than your standard pacific northwest and they're trying to showcase that and it it is interesting um with cascade 
in, in Colorado, from day one, we've had brewers tell us that it's slightly different. It's more grapefruity, more citrusy, less lemongrassy, kind of more vibrant. Um, now, why is that exactly? Is it you know, because we're more hands-on on every step and, and we're getting like a better product or is it because of the terroir? There's certainly no science on it. Nobody's doing research on, um, I mean, CSU extension in some places are, I shouldn't say nobody, that's not fair, but there's not a large amount of research being done to, to exactly note it. But yes, absolutely there there are differences and if you think historically like that was so amazing like every little town had their own brewery and that was the community place that you went to share your stories and complain about the government or whatever it is that you wanted to talk about and and the whole families went and that was their beer was made with the hops from their area and and every little community was proud of their beer and their hops and now it's like oh well we want every variety tastes the same because because we need our like Darren was just saying we need our hazy IPA to taste the same every time because 70% of my consumers want that and and so that puts brewers in a tough position too they can want to spread that out and and do things different but if the consumer is not going to buy it well they can't do it you know they got to make ends meet on their side and so i think to some degree um I could harp on brewers and say, why don't you buy more of our hops? But it, there's also this whole scene of the consumer and, and what they want to buy. And, and if they're not demanding that the ingredients in the beer are from local independent farms, if they're not demanding that every week we have a new IPA that's different than the one before or a, a new Doppelbach or whatever, then it's hard to do that. So I think the part of like what I'm learning and trying to do is, is educate um, like our amazing beer drinkers that like, let's get even nerdier, you know, let's just not stop nerding out at, at a hazy or the West coast or the, you know, but let's dive deeper. What's in it. Um, where is it grown? Where is it coming from? And how does that happen? Like different breweries are doing side by sides of the same beer, but hops grown in, um, you know, in different areas. Um, they're playing with the terroir. A few years ago, Comrade Brewery, and they not only did it, they did it between two same beer, two different um, hops from our, brewer, or our farm and then one up in uh Paonia, so not even that far, but what are the nuances within the region? Um, so that is something that's coming about. People are becoming more aware of it. But, you know, just like you get your tomato at the farmer's market or you get it at a city market, you know, people know that's an option. But when you go to drink a beer, you don't even really think that that's an option. Like, where did the malt come from in this beer? Where And, and so I think getting that out there is really, really cool. And talking about the terroir and educating people is super cool. And um, yeehaw. Well, that's a great one. Hey, congratulations. Um, I heard you guys won the Cascade Cup. Yes, we did. Um, thank you. Uh, I am still flabbergasted. Um, we won the Cascade Cup, which is the prestigious uh, award from Hop Quality Group, announced uh, once a year. Uh, we actually won it last year as well and was the first farm ever to win it outside of Washington or Oregon. Uh, and then pulled it off again and was the first farm ever to win it back to back this year. Wait, um, you won it two years in a row? We won it two years in a row. Yep. Congrats. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, yeah, still still soaking in. Um, so, yeah, we grow some for some pretty awesome hops. Oh, that's great. Darren, does that make you want to get more of her hops? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Yeah. But, <laughs> let's say you have some Cascades and some of her hops. And you were going to make a Colorado beer from scratch. 
what 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 would you do that the next time you get a chance to work with her stuff? Get a small batch, and tell us about. You, so you guys, do you do you mostly serve your beer on draft? What size batches are you making? Uh, so yeah, pretty much everything we do is on draft. Uh, yeah, we go. Uh, we sell a lot through. We sell about thirty to forty percent of our beer through the tap room volume wise and then uh then we're in a bunch of bars and restaurants across town and then yeah we brew our brew house is 15 barrels and all of our tanks are 30 barrels uh, so uh we don't have like a pilot system or anything so we just kind of go for it every time and hopefully it hopefully it works uh we have had to dump a, dump a couple of batches uh which is no fun but uh you can't put 60 kegs of uh bad beer into the market but uh i think if we if we were to work with uh billy goat again i I think we'd probably want to do something hop forward so like an ipa or something um just to showcase those hops uh, because that would be a big part of it and then what you'd be you'd be open to to experimenting with the hops that would be the feature of the beer yeah yeah i think so yeah yeah how how do you how how do you see that playing out with you know, working with different breweries, um, are, are you pushing the? Do you want them to use your hops as part of their their whole bill, or, or, or are you looking for someone to try to come up with like a, a real Colorado identity beer? You, you know, um, I'm really I'm looking for it all, but but I I want it. I want us and other small hot farms, monsters to be a part of the beer and a part of the brewery from, you know, all sides like this. Oh, we do a one-off all Colorado beer as a seasonal. No, no. That's like, I, I call BS because you're trying to do the right thing, but you're just, you're just doing it to like sound good, to look good. Like if you want to, if you want to support the, these other small businesses and local ag, then just do it. You know, like let's be, we got bittering hops. We got forward hops. Yeah. Go ahead and dry hop it with some mosaic afterwards. Great. I love it. I don't care. You know, we don't have, it doesn't have to be like, Oh, that fresh flavor in your mouth. That's Billy goat. Sure. It'd be great to have some beers like that, but, but like, Put us in the mix, you know. Um, throw us in there, like, like, do it or don't. Like, one beer a year. That's all Colorado's. Cool. Yeah. No, the, I like your attitude, and we're off to a great start. We're gonna take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. Thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at HearstRanch.com. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. 
Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Hey, it's our 15th year on Beer Sessions Radio, so great job. Support us. Become a member at heritageradionetwork.org. So we've got goat on goat on goat today. We've got Goat Patch Brewing and uh, Billy Goat uh, Hot Farm. So, Audrey, we're going to keep talking with you because um, you're one of the most interesting people we've talked to in a while. Um, I love your passion. Well, I always love small farms and, and, and agriculture. And to me, that's, that's, I feel like so much of why I used to drink beer or wine was, was about, you know, the farm to glass, the, the, the connection with the food and the land and everything. Um, I was curious, like, with, with the small farms that you know, you know, no matter what, you're going to struggle. Um, are you just hops or are you doing a mix of crops? And have you ever, Considered, I, 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 well, that's the first question. Do you all hops or you're a mixed crop? Um, we're just doing hops. Uh, we, we dove into hemp for two years and we lost every penny and sweat and tear that we put into it. So, uh, we aren't doing that anymore. Learn the hard way on that one. But, um, we are switching gears because we do need a, um, we do need an alternative um, source of income. And so I uh, worked really hard to get some permits and we now um, have a permit to have a campground on the farm. We have a permit to sell beer and wine on the farm to have one large uh, festival a year and then up to 20 smaller events a year. Um, so we've just, we've just gotten that, um, nothing no infrastructure or anything is quite set up um we do a couple farm tours a year i want to start pushing that more especially now with being able to sell beer you know have have a beer along with the tour um is kind of the the new route that we're going agrotourism and i i would love to have a ton of baby goats out so i don't i got to look this goat yoga thing up and see if we can get a bunch of goats that go patch out. We'll just have a big old goat party. Yeah. No, Jim with Rocky Mountain Goat Yoga is great. So, so we're going to put them on a truck and bring them over. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> goat walkabouts, all the, like different, like, you know, like retirement homes and stuff and do like goat therapy and stuff. So like, they're very mobile. Oh, cool. Yeah. Wow. So the goat thing. Hey, Avery, are you guys going to be, part of any upcoming festivals yeah so we're going to be part of um Fergin fest which is coming back this year for their 17th year so that's here at, at bristol brewing company in town um has like 17 plus breweries and it's just kind of like a celebration of just one off Fergins. and then we do have an exciting announcement that we are going to be the official beer partner for meadowgrass this year Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's a big, big deal. So it's the 15th year of the festival. We're going to be the only beer there. We'll be there all three days. So, Wow. Do you have to gear up for that? Oh, yeah. So it's up in Black Forest. It's like there's been years that it's snowed. There's been years that it's been very hot, cold. So it's just kind of like we're going up there for Memorial Day weekend, and we're going to see what happens. But That's cool. Audrey, do you guys do you guys host a, a, a festival like a fresh hop festival? <laughs> we sure do. Um, we host the Southwest Fresh Fest, um, and so we've had two so far. Our third one will be September twenty first, uh, twenty twenty four, coming up. Um, and so it's all fresh hop beer, um, and now it's Beer Sessions Radio. But just in case anybody doesn't know, that's where the hops go straight off the vine uh, and into a brew within 24 hours. And so that week of harvest is hands down our craziest week of the year. Um, this year, we sent out over 6,700 pounds of fresh hops uh, to five different states. We send uh, big U-Haul trucks and a driver. They usually leave at three in the morning. Uh, you know, assuming nothing breaks down. And um, so that they're driving through the cool of the night and then they can arrive at the brewery uh, in the morning where they have their batch already going. They're ready to just 
you know, throw the hops in and keep brewing. Um, yeah, we sent a couple drivers out to Denver, one to Phoenix, Albuquerque. We actually sent someone all the way down to uh, Austin, Texas this year. Uh, we had a brewer from uh, uh, Wyoming come down uh, or Idaho, excuse me, come down. Um, so it's, it's really fun because the fresh hop beer and it really ties agriculture to the beer industry. You cannot get fresher than that. Um, it's, and you can only have it one time a year, um, at harvest. And so, and then also the beer is ready when harvest over. So it's also a little celebration for finishing up, uh, by time the beer is ready. And so our festival, um, highlights that it's all fresh hot beers. Uh, this last year we had 13 breweries come, we had 15 different fresh hot beers. Uh, so you get a little ticket to, you get a little taster glass. You can go around and sample as many as you want. Uh, we had a couple of live bluegrass bands, um, and yeah, I would do a farm tour. So if anybody wants to come, we go do a big walk around the farm and I talk some more and, um, yeah, it's, it's a ton of fun. And then we have this awesome, like metal hop cone trophy we had made, uh, that the best, um, fresh hop beer of the season that gets voted on by everybody that comes, they get to take the trophy home for the year. Uh, base camp brewery up in uh, Grand Junction won this year, but I mean we had breweries from uh, all the way from Longmont come down. We had uh, one from Phoenix come up. Albuquerque Brewery came up. Um, so it's a pretty fun event. And um, again, you know, like I was saying earlier, it's all it's it's fun, but it's also learning, right? Like like a lot of people don't know what fresh hop beers are. A lot of people don't know where hops come from, what they even look like, um, and so it's, it's a fun way to, to share that information. That's great. And then, uh, yeah. Darren and Avery, any, anything else I need to say, you know, if I go to, if I go to goat patch brewing, um, is there something unique that, that I should check out when I'm there? Besides Darren's goat patch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. I think we're just, uh, like our thing is, uh, we just try to make people feel at home when they drink here, uh, we try to have a little something on for everybody. So, uh, uh, we say the home and balanced brews. So, uh, we have a balanced selection of balanced beers. Uh, so we usually have about 12 beers on at a time. Uh, yeah, as far as uniqueness, uh, I think, uh, the, like a lot of the events we do with goats and stuff, uh, I think is kind of makes us unique. We do a lot of uh, a lot of fundraising in the community for uh, nonprofits and stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, we just really want to be a part of the community and want uh, yeah, just want people to feel at home. Everybody who comes here to 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 want to be here, and want to stay here. Yeah, like our core values are adventure, balance, and community. So I feel like we do a really good job of hitting all those marks are trying our best to hit all those marks just from different community events. Like we just hosted our first deaf night out a couple weeks ago, which was a huge hit. And like, we got really good feedback from that. We're partnering with uh, Colorado college, which is right down the street from us to rebrand our blonde ale, which is one of our flagships for their 150th anniversary. So that's like a huge, huge thing that's just now coming out in the community. Um, so we're excited to see where that partnership goes. Cause I know a lot of, especially colleges in, or not especially, but colleges in Colorado and the United States, they don't really have their own beer, but CC is about to. So that's pretty cool. And the then tigers. that's great. The tigers. <laughs> and then just like with the meadow grass stuff too, you know, they've been around for 15 years. It's a huge, you know, way to showcase music. We've got some really cool headliners this year coming back from years past too. And yeah, I mean, I would say out of all of them, community is probably our biggest. Cool. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> wow. Well, and balance, that's the home of Ballast Brews. We try to make the beers at least edible. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I, I, I love talking to you guys. I, and I feel at home and I feel like I know you all. Um, and, I, you know, maybe one day I'll get to come out and visit with you guys. But Avery and Darren and, and Audrey, thanks so much for joining me on Heritage Radio Network. A big shout out to Armin Spengen, our engineer, and I'm Jimmy Carboni. We'll catch you next time on Heritage Radio Network.
All right. Thanks so much, guys. Cheers. Thanks. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.